Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Health Babes podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Becky Campbell with Dr. Crystal Hone. Today, we have Dr. Jolene Brighton on. Dr. Jolene is a hormone expert. She's a nutrition scientist, and she's really a thought leader in women's medicine. She's board certified in naturopathic endocrinology and cr- trained in clinical sexology. She is the author of two books, Beyond the Pill, and her latest is This Normal. It's a non judgmental guide to creating hormone balance, eliminating unwanted symptoms, and building the sexual desire you crave. Everybody, let's welcome Dr. Jolene Brighton to the show. Dr. Jolene is like the OG of hormones. I've known her for a long time, and I really, I mean, I feel like a lot of stuff that we know in the functional medicine world is because of you. So we're so excited to have you. Well, thank (laughs) you so much. Yeah. And we have known each other for a long time, but just like the post pandemic world, we we have not spoken in a bit. So it's so good to see you today and to meet Crystal. And I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah, we are too. So let's talk about understanding hormones and kind of what we see in the functional medicine world. So I think most of us in the functional space see a lack of understanding of the menstrual cycle and how it works. You know, there's a huge misunderstanding. So why do you think that is? Well, it's a bit complicated and we're told not to worry about it. Like all you need to know is when your last menstrual period was right. And unless you want to have a baby, don't worry about any of the rest of it. We're not going to teach you about ovulation, how to track ovulation until maybe even after you've been unsuccessful in becoming pregnant after six to 12 months of trying. So I think that's a big part of it is just the idea of medicine is as long as your periods are coming, everything is fine. We don't, you don't need to, you don't need to worry your pretty little head about understanding all of this. And in truth, because I lecture with a lot of clinicians, there are a lot of doctors who don't understand hormones, don't understand the menstrual cycle to the degree that, you know, perhaps I do because it's what I do all day, every day. And I think, you know, as somebody who has a degree in chemistry, who loves chemistry, you present me with the steroid pathway and I'm giddy. I'm like, yeah, let's (laughs) move these molecules. And I love this. But a lot of people are like, I have PTSD from like what I, you know, all of my pre-med courses or like, I just like, this looks too complicated. And it does look really overwhelming to look at the steroid pathways, to start to look at the graphs and the changes that happen with the menstrual cycle. But in is this normal? I've simplified it. I've even put lots of visual aids in there to make it so that it is accessible because it's my belief that we should not be gatekeeping this information and that women are absolutely smart enough to understand all of this. Like hop into a fertility chat board and I, you know, I see women who I'm like, wow, you know more than like the average primary care doctor about what is happening in your body. Yeah, it's they so- do because they've been reading, you know, they mm-hmm. things like your book. She has a new book called, is this normal? It's great. I, you know, your first book beyond the pill was amazing as well. And you've really taught a lot of people, but I noticed that too, like people are really learning, you know, from these books and they do, they know more than their primary care doctor. And they, they know, understand it is important to know much more than, okay, you get your period on this day. There's yeah. so many reasons why knowing your cycle and the different phases of it is important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And when you understand your cycle, the different phases, like you can understand what's going on, why you have the symptoms that you do and be able to intervene. And that I think is really empowering. And it's been just such a disservice to see that medicine didn't even care about nutrition until very recently. Now you're seeing conventional doctors who are like, we're lifestyle medicine experts. And I'm like, honey, you just arrived. Like, (laughs) Welcome to the party. But no, like just because you took a weekend nutrition course, you are not an expert in this. Um, Your opinions are, you know, great opinions sometimes, but they're not expert opinions. And I say that as somebody who is a nutrition scientist who spent time in university, actually acquiring this education and getting a degree. And so I think that's just important for people to understand as well as that you'll see a lot of people out there throwing out this information and being like, oh, nutrition does nothing. Or I've never seen a study that any foods can actually change your hormones. And I'm like, well, just tell me you're not looking, like, just tell me you're not looking because they're, I mean, when we talk about sulforaphane and the research on broccoli sprouts that exists, like there is this research here, but there are just people who 
really it's, I think the most disheartening thing is when you see other women who are so dismissal of women's symptoms mm -hmm. who are coming out being like hormone imbalances are not real. And then you're like, well, let's talk about hypothyroidism. Let's talk right. about PCOS. Let's talk about hyperinsulinemia. Let's talk about the fact that low progesterone is an issue and that leaves estrogen unchallenged. This does exist in the research. You can have luteal phase defects. Like all of this exists, but all you're saying is that I mean, it's just patriarchal parody where they're just like symptoms are in your head. La, 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 la. This is just the existence of being a woman. And like, you know, if you believe that like you can shift your hormones with food, like you're just being duped. And I'm like, yes, we're duping people. We're duping people with broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Right. That is so true. So <laughs> let's let's get into the menstrual cycle a little bit. What do totally. normal fluctuations with our hormones look like? And what's the purpose of these hormones throughout the cycle? Yeah. So this is so you I love the way you frame this. Uh, there are fluctuations throughout the cycle. And so you'll see the the follicular phase. So when our period starts. That's where we're in the follicular phase. Now in medicine, we recognize the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. But you'll see a lot of people, and I even broke it down in Is This Normal, talking about the period and the it being its own phase. And the reason I did that is because that is what resonates with the average individual, mm -hmm. right? So whatever medicine, that's great. Like this, I can explain it from medicine's perspective, but the average individual is like, I feel like my period is different. It's a different experience. So let's talk about that. So you'll see that we will sometimes split the follicular phase into the period and then the late follicular phase. But it's important for everyone to understand, same, same. It's mm -hmm. all the follicular phase because um, we don't really care about what the uterus is doing so much because the entire agenda of the menstrual cycle is ovulation. It right. actually starts with ovulation. We never teach it that way. I don't even, you, you know, I didn't even start there with like ovulation yeah. because mm -hmm. it's tricky. It's tricky to like dial in ovulation when you don't understand this. And so we're like, let's teach it from a place of the period because that helps you grasp it really quickly and start to incorporate it and start to take ownership of this information. So we've got our period. That is going to be when estrogen is predominant in the cycle. And most people think like, oh, well, your hormones drop when you get your period and therefore they stay low until like you get in your ovulation. This is not true. In fact, we will measure your blood anywhere from day two to four to get your estradiol of your follicular phase, matching it against FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, just to understand what is your estrogen at the time. And this is a great way to start screening for fertility. So We've got estrogen rising as early as day two. Ovaries are already getting ready. We then are moving into that late follicular phase. And that's when testosterone's there the whole time. But when you start to feel the effects of testosterone more, of estrogen more, and estrogen's going to spike just at ovulation, that spike in estrogen. So this is a time where estrogen being high is good for people to understand because everybody's like, they either, if you're postmenopausal, you love estrogen. And if you're premenopausal, you're like, that's <laughs> the devil. And I'm like, she's our bestie. Okay. Yeah. Just like sometimes she's love extra. Her. Like we all have that friend. We all have that friend where you're like, calm down. <laughs> so estrogen spikes, and that's going to happen to trigger the ovulation sequence. So it triggers LH to be released from the brain. So now now we switch from FSH, L uh, LH is coming up now, then we ovulate. And now post ovulation, estrogen takes a back seat, progesterone comes in, estrogen's still there, but this is where progesterone should own this phase. And so this is why you'll hear people say, oh, we can't test hormones because they fluctuate all the time and hormone right. imbalances should be happening. They should be imbalanced. And I'm like, that's not what people are talking about. Right. Um, it, it feels very um, like gaslighting to right. me. Yeah. It just feels like another level yes. of like, let me try to Jedi mind you with my BS as a doctor. I wear my white coat. Therefore, I know your body better. How could you know what's going on or this experience? So this is when a lot of people will have symptoms because if progesterone, so especially like in perimenopause, progesterone fails to rise um, to the degree we need it. Now estrogen's left unchallenged. Now we've got those PMS symptoms or maybe everything's going fine. We can measure post-ovulation five to seven days after that, your progesterone, but maybe it starts coming down too soon. And at that point, you start having those PMS symptoms showing up a couple of days before your period. So now you're not sleeping. You feel like you're easy to cry. You're having anxiety. That's some of the ways that that low progesterone can show up. 
And for anybody who is a bit of a nerd, take a trip to PubMed and you will find information talking about this relative estrogen dominance state where you don't have enough estrogen and you have too much estrogen going, excuse me, back that up, where you don't have enough progesterone and you have too much estrogen relative to that, but your estrogen's not really problematic in the sense that it's super high. It's just that that diva took the stage and she just <laughs> took over and progesterone never stood a chance. It's so, so true. So we're kind of touching on hormonal imbalances, but so what are the, the most common hormonal imbalances you'll see? Sure. So I think, you know, depending on the age group that, I mean, that's how we really start to look at things by far and away. I mean, when you get into your thirties, we're going to see a lot more hypothyroidism mm -hmm. in, is this normal? I have a pyramid and at the base of the pyramid, I show adrenal and insulin as the foundation of your hormone health. And a lot of people, as you both know, go through life with adrenal issues. We oh. get away with a lot in our 20s. And then come our 30s, we're like, why am I dragging it? What's going on? <laughs> and that can start to create problems on the next tier, which is our thyroid. And we know that over age 35, we got a lot of women being diagnosed with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So that feeling of I'm fatigued. And I know a lot of doctors out there are dismissing fatigue and they're even taking to social media and telling on themselves being like, oh, everyone has fatigue. Like, that's not a thing to worry about. I'm like, have you heard of cancer? Cause I bet you have. And like, though, fatigue is definitely something that's concerning, but you may also have hair loss, irregular periods coming from that dry skin constipation. And in the book, I have a whole symptom questionnaire to go through to evaluate your hormones. And why this is super important is because once we get into 40s and you're definitely in that perimenopausal phase, all we got is symptoms to go off of. Yeah. We cannot diagnose perimenopause with any tests. So there are no tests for the hormone imbalances that exist in perimenopause. And yes, hormone imbalances exist in perimenopause because now the ovaries are failing to ovulate as regularly. The only path to ovulation or to progesterone is via ovulation. And so what we see is low progesterone, the same symptoms I talked about before, high estrogen. Interesting about high estrogen that maybe people aren't familiar with is that if you are in a partnered relationship, we have small studies, we need bigger ones and more robust, but I don't think we need to wait for those studies for what I'm gonna say. I think it resonates with a lot of my patients and a lot of people listening is that when estrogen goes high and it's left unchecked, we can feel more critical of our partners. So we can be more critical of our children, of people at work, but also, but mostly those people that we cohabitate with that are like getting on your nerves, that can be that estrogen unchecked. And this is why sometimes, now I'm not saying like, you gotta, like, there's not a problem in the relationship, but sometimes women are like, I really was so in love with my husband. And now <laughs> I just feel like everything about them irritates me. And I'm like, and you're 48. Let's talk about this because there can be hormonal issues. And that is where the top of the pyramid is, is the sex hormones or the ovarian hormones. And really those ovarian hormones, they can be problematic at any phase in our life as any woman can attest to. Yeah. has had like heavy periods, painful periods, um, anxiety, mood swings, feeling like you can just cry so easily. Yeah. And these hormonal imbalances, they, they are so common. What, what are some, you know, common ones, but they may be more dangerous that people need to maybe look into things like endometriosis. Like can mm -hmm. you talk about some of those? Oh, certainly. So, you know, as we talked about at the top of this podcast, advocating for yourself is so important because people, they are doctors who absolutely dismiss you. That is why I put checklists in my book. So there's an endometriosis checklist that is in, so you can understand and figure out what might be going on with your body, but also so you can take it to your doctor. It can take a woman with endometriosis a decade or more to get diagnosed. Yeah. PCOS, yeah. you're going to go through several physicians for that. So I gave you exactly the language that you need right. to use to your doctor so that you can skip the line, basically, like jump the queue and get that diagnosis and start to get help. So with endometriosis, there's a lot of research and a lot of experts who are looking at it as more of an autoimmune condition. And I think that's important for people to understand because um, a lot of the times the focus will be just on hormonal control and those tissues, which are, they're kind of like the lining of your uterus in that they respond to these hormones and they bleed, but they're definitely different. 
they're not exactly like the lining of the uh, uterus, which is what people often think like, oh, endometriosis, endometrial like tissue. And that's what we used to think. We've got new research. So estrogen can be problematic in that estrogen is proliferative. It can cause the growth of tissues. And when that bleeds, and there's not supposed to be blood outside the uterus, the immune system comes in and says, we have to handle this. And then we we see development of adhesions, which is very, very painful. And as I talk in the book, the chapter sex of all kinds, pain with sex can be one of the first ways this shows up. And yet pain in women is dismissed. I go through multiple studies, like one showing that if you go to the ER and just because you have ovaries, you're going to sit in that waiting room 30% of the time longer than a man, but a man doesn't have ovaries, which means right. ectopic pregnancy and these life-threatening conditions that only exist for, uh, you know, uterus owners that d- doesn't exist for them. And yet women's pain is dismissed. Endometriosis, this is part of why women struggle to get the diagnosis. And so pain with sex, that's going to be dismissed at an even a higher rate because doctors are like, why do you even need to have sex? Like I learned that like, it's, you know, just a bonus for you if you do. Um, yeah. So with endometriosis, it's definitely a condition where we look at um, estrogen, making sure that we've got the right estrogen metabolites and that we're supporting keeping inflammation low and the adrenal glands. And if people listening are like, what the hell do the adrenal glands have to do with endometriosis? If there is inflammation, there is a demand on the adrenal glands to produce cortisol, and that can become taxing over time in the same way that hypothyroidism due to an autoimmune condition can as well. And that is what people will call adrenal fatigue, but we really know now, and I explain this in the book, it's HPA dysregulation. It's a brain uh, adrenal communication and a receptor issue. And if people are like, yeah. what? Don't worry. I cover it all in the book so that you can really understand. <laughs> yeah, she all breaks that. it down good. <laughs> yeah. My mom had endometriosis. And I mean, I just remember her like pulling over, driving home in such pain. And yeah. it was awful. And no one cared. I mean, you know, she eventually then had a hysterectomy. It was like, don't care. Okay. Hysterectomy. That, that was kind of the two oh, choices yeah. she had, you know, but that gets it, me. this is uh, like that. Mm, I'm like, don't get mad. Keep yeah. it cool. But I do get <laughs> mad because then it is like, they treat the uterus. Like, do you, can you have babies? Do you want babies? No. It's an expendable organ. And yet we lack so much research. Like we have a bit of an understanding that it's involved in our immune system. Like, what are we doing? Just taking this out. But medicine's like, it's just a baby container. What do you need it for? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. damn, you guys, we used to do that with the appendix, the gallbladder, like all kinds of stuff. And like, why are you not learning? Why are you not learning from the mistake that like your body needs these organs? And there's definitely a time and a place for a hysterectomy. Endometriosis Mm -hmm. is absolutely not one of them because endometriosis by definition are adhesions and tissues, these, you know, growths outside of the uterus. So I hate to break it to anyone who has had a hysterectomy. And I apologize on the behalf of medicine. If you have, and you find that your endometriosis was not taken care of and didn't go away. I mean, it's 2023. We still have doctors being like, just take out your uterus or have a baby. And I'm like, damn, you know, what's worse than like being in pain with endo, being in pain with endo and having to take care of a baby. Like, no, Mm -hmm. that is not a cure. These are myths that are perpetuated in medicine by quite frankly, physicians who just are like, I learned this once upon a time, therefore it's the, you know, doctrine and are not looking into the research. And the really, unless you're an endometriosis expert, you should be referring that patient to someone who is, who can be doing excision surgery because a lot of the time these adhesions, they can be found on the bowels. They can be found on the bladder. And that's why pain may not even be your main symptom. It may be changes in bowel movements or changes in urination. And, um, you know, adhesions have even been found in the lungs. That's way less common, but these actual tissues, these little satellite tissues that go around the body, um, people cough up blood and they're like, oh my God, what's going on? And lo and behold, it's endometriosis. So that just really illustrates this is not isolated to the uterus. Um, adenomyosis, as I talk about in the book is different. That's going to be in the walls of the uterus and having a hysterectomy can bring relief to women, but to anybody listening, keep your ovaries and keep your hormone production up as long as you can. I was literally just reading your article on the Mm -hmm. adenomyosis the other day. (laughs) 
Dr. Brian has a great website, guys, for articles. Mm -hmm. It's so true. You break things down beautifully and simply, and they're great. What are some other things? You're welcome. What are some other things, common issues that are thought to be normal, but aren't? We talked a little bit about endo, but what are some other things that come to mind? Yeah. So with endo, we, you know, we really covered the piece of period pain, which definitely gets dismissed, but feeling wildly emotional, Mm -hmm. that should not be considered normal. If you cry a little bit before your period, that's okay. If you feel a little bit like I'm just fed up with people before your period, totally okay. If you're like, look, I got to get in bed and like put on an eye mask and earplugs and not talk to anybody for several days, definitely extreme and not okay. But a lot of the times we're told things like, oh, your hormones are just made to make you crazy. When in reality, this could be signs that you're neurodivergent. So you could be autistic or have ADHD. It could be PMDD. Um, And a lot of times what we see in our culture is that these symptoms are much, much worse as we get into perimenopause. And rather than anybody saying, I mean, this is where it's so problematic to be like hormone imbalances are not real. There's nothing you can do about it because it's like, but you acknowledge that these symptoms are because of our hormones, but because that is such the mantra that is parroted without anybody stopping to really like, put a little thought into it, this demographic is uh, the highest prescribed and receivers of prescriptions of mood altering drugs. So antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. And I'm like, wow, but like those things don't necessarily protect your brain health, your bone health, your heart health, your myelin sheath of your brain, like all of these things in the way that bioidentical progesterone could, or Mm -hmm. even, you know, estradiol, once you get into that phase where you're not producing enough estrogen, but instead, because again, if it's a women specific issue, we've lacked, we lack the research, we lack the um, understanding, we lack the, you know, just given an F honestly in medicine, it's like, ah, we'll just medicate them away, which is really a throwback to the time where like we were medicating moms with like Valium in the 1950s and like, you know, putting women, you know, under twilight, uh, anesthesia so that like, we could just extract babies from them. It's this entire thing of like, let's just get the woman out of the way and like, just, you know, hush her up. My, my mom was under twilight with my birth. I'm like, (laughs) you're this is my own bag. I know, I know Mom, but like she's, she's listening. Mom, we love you. <laughs> and at the same time, like cheers to her for even sharing that with you. Yeah. And for yep. sharing her story, because if it wasn't for women consistently sharing their stories, like the generations that come next would never know that there's a better way. And that is so, so powerful. And I think for everyone listening, this is something I always encourage, like tell your story because you never know who will be healed by it, how healing it can be from you for you and how you can actually change medicine for the better. You know, I look at, um, beyond the pill came out, man, did a lot of doctors hate me for that. They were like, they find like every way to act like a politician of being like, she's anti-birth control. And I'm like, (laughs) anti-birth control, but like, Oh, make an us versus them camp. And like, then you can attack and like, you know, dehumanize me, whatever, whatever they have changed their script. A lot of the same doctors who attacked me, I now see them on social media being like, yes, it's true that the birth control pill does not fix PCOS. And I'm like, you might hate me, but I came to do what I did and it's yeah. got done. <laughs> you you opened the conversation. And yes. the whole reason is because patients started talking about it, started questioning it. And that lazy, like, oh, you have an irregular period, just take a pill. And I'm not even going to talk to you about it. Way of operating has been asked to change. It's been demanded to change and not everybody's changed, but definitely young providers are starting to change that script. And I'm seeing it and I'm like, that's amazing because- And for anybody who's like, this is news to you, let me just explain real quick. One of the hallmarks, and this is in, is this normal? I break down how to get the diagnosis of PCOS. One of the three criteria that we look at, you have to have two out of three is in ovulatory cycles. You don't ovulate or they're irregular ovulation. That's what causes the missing periods and the irregular periods. So the problem Problems rooted in insulin, inflammation, and a whole lot more that we don't understand because we need more research. So ask me again in 10 years, and I hope to have a better um, answer on exactly what is going on for everybody. But we know that the hormone imbalance of insulin dysregulation and testosterone leads to these anovulatory cycles. If you don't ovulate, you don't menstruate. And so answer me, how can you fix a problem which is due to lack of ovulation when we talk about the period part? with a medication that keeps you from ovulating. It makes zero sense. It makes zero sense. sense. Yet 
There have been for a very long time, and they still exist out there, many doctors saying, we fixed your PCOS with the pill. They didn't. No. And they didn't do anything to address your inflammation, your insulin dysregulation, your cardiometabolic risk, your risk of depression, or any of the other things that ride with PCOS. They probably didn't even tell you about it because what medicine loves to do is reduce this to a reproductive capacity. Baby or no baby, what is it going to be? And that's all they really care about so often. And listen, like as I make this generalization, there are absolutely exceptions out there and I want people to understand that. I, sure. I have doctors who are exceptions that I work with as a patient, but this is a lot of what women experience and go through. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's true. Let's switch gears a little bit. So you talk about the orgasm gap. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're kind of switching gears, but we're kind of not because this is where medicine messed it all up for women mm -hmm. again. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about in the book, um, in the clitoral conspiracy in which medicine absolutely sought out to remove doctors from having any knowledge of the clitoris, let alone the average woman, because when they figured out that this thing only existed for pleasure, well, part of, part of what the scholars say is that, well, men became under threat and they're like, let's just not talk about it. Women don't need pleasure. This is not that important. And now we arrive to where we are in this modern day. And what we see in heterosexual couples is that roughly about 95% of men are going to orgasm every time they do it. Whereas yep. only 65% of women are going to orgasm every time we do, they do it. And we do it. <laughs> I am a woman. I have a clitoris too. Uh, but there's this huge gap there. And um, <laughs> there's this huge gap there. And we really, um, you know, cannot go to just looking at men. This is uh, when I talk about this and I really I probably should have spent a lot more time in the book being like, this is not because men are trash. Um, no. I do yeah. say in the book, if men, you know, if men had access to this information, they would absolutely read up on it. We've got a big problem though, where like men teach men about women's bodies. Um, mm -hmm. Or <laughs> I mean, porn does. And then yes. they think you have an orgasm in the second Two seconds. inserted, <laughs> which is yeah. ridiculous. Well, I mean, but it's not even porn. So I cite like things like, um, you know, vampire diaries and gossip girl and all yeah. of these other things that like 90210, right? Cause I'm old like that. Um, all of these shows that were like coming of age shows that like when we are in our formative years and we're starting to get the fills in our another region that we're watching this and we're like, okay, no one talks about consent. There's no condom. And they instantly orgasm with vaginal yeah. penetration. And by the way, the only type of sex is a penis and a vagina. And if it's anything else, like that like that's just something yeah. else and that is all that's all myths and yeah. so i think it's important for people to understand that women also subscribe to this idea that they're supposed to be able to orgasm with vaginal penetration and even like sex that like contributed to this they're like well, hey everybody here's a vagina you know what it's for penises go in babies go out and that's it and you're like but you just talked about a man and you just talked about a baby but you didn't talk about me that yeah. owns this. I am the vagina owner here. Could we like break it down for me? <laughs> and so that is problematic in itself as well. And for yeah. anyone listening, I give one of the statistics in the book, which is only about 18% of women are orgasming with vaginal penetration alone. And even then, because the clitoris is this massive, like, you know, subterranean organ that is around the vaginal wall, still may have clitoral stimulation happening. And the orgasm has more to do with anatomy, they think, than anything else. So it's basically like how you were born and what your anatomy set up and the the distance that everything exists, which lends itself to like you're probably still getting clitoral stimulation, dictates whether or not you will have a vaginal orgasm. Now you can still have a vaginal orgasm, but you're going to need, you know, penetration plus stimulation of the clitoris. Yeah. And I talk about all of that in the book. I actually commissioned an artist to hand draw yes, the clitoris. Awesome. Yes. There's like several clitoral um, anatomy fi well, people figures. People don't know. The They're never taught this stuff. Medical textbooks don't have it. Right. I was like, look, I am not going to wait around for medicine to get it, get it together and actually like an put artist. this in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just going to hire an artist. I am going to be like, sir, we need to like come up with this. And we're going to reference what is out there was actually out there in the research, what studies have shown. Um, and we're going to go about it that way. And so when you get, is this normal? And you look at that, know that you're getting more information about the clitoris than your average doctor ever got. Like, unless they're a specialist that actually works. And it's usually like some somebody who's working um, in the urogenital tract and not your gynecologist even has gotten this level of information. 
And awesome. a lot of the time, you know, it's like, oh, men don't know where the, where the clitoris is. Well, women don't either, yes. you know? Yeah. I mean, women not who masturbate all, do, but, <laughs> but some, you know what I mean? That like, it's just yeah. that education is so poor that some women don't know their anatomy either. So yeah. it's like, well, there's a lot of shame too. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of shame not to touch down there, not to look down there. I mean, some women feel even shame that they can't use a tampon yeah. because that's somehow wrong. And so, you know, that's a whole nother thing to unpack in society. that I feel like, you know, we need to have like everybody shame around our bodies. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about like sex drive and the stigma around women having a low sex drive. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Uh, it's bullshit. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and listen, like anytime we talk about this, women are like, Oh yeah, actually that makes total sense. So this goes back to what medicine loves to do, which is be like, this is the male body and it is the archetype of perfection. And this is what every standard should be. And if you deviate from that, your problem. Um, mm -hmm. And then over here, we've got this like inferior version with baby making accessories. And so we just compare everything to the standard, right? I mean, not even until like almost the early 2000s did we actually start getting studies where drug companies were like, hey, these people who menstruate might respond to drugs differently. And it's like, duh, like seriously, like again, men teaching men, this is a yeah. problem. <laughs> so yeah. with that, um, it's just, I think really important that we all, um, you know, we all recognize I am actually losing my thought here. It's okay. Ask me your question again. I started yes, going off on another sure. tangent and then I was of like, don't do that. I was talking about, you know, sex drive and the stigma around women. Uh, having okay. Sex yes. Drive. Yeah. Okay. So I started, I was, I was like, don't go on that tangent. I'm glad that I did. Okay. So <laughs> we get it. it. <laughs> yes. So we can just edit that out. <laughs> it never <Yeah>. happens. <laughs> so when it comes to our sexual desire, um, a lot of times we're told women have a low libido, except mm -hmm. that women are like, but at the start of the relationship, I didn't have a low libido. Yeah. Because hormones meet neurotransmitters and you're totally into them. And then as a relationship progresses, like, you know, estimates in the research say like, you can only keep up all the dopamine, serotonin, feel goods, uh, for one to three years. Mm -hmm. That's the max. And then you start to see a decline. So now you're less addicted to this person. Truly you're mm -hmm. less, um, you know, excited, excitable, and that's good. It's a good normal or yeah. uh, adaptation. And so if that's happened to you, that's normal. And we talk about in the book, there's a couple of psychological theories. I definitely get into the hormones of things because when you look at the psychological theory by Bancroft and Jansen called the dual control model, where they use an analogy about the gas pedal and the brake. And I love this because that's what people think of, of a like switch, like on off, but a gas pedal and brake is a little smoother than that. And mm -hmm. that is really more what things are like. But one of the brakes can be hormone issues. It could be birth control or it can be your own hormone. So we cannot ignore that. Yeah. And so when I say breaks, this is literally the stuff that checks you when you get the sexual stimuli. So if you think about your nervous system as a train track, because that's how sex is starting is via your nervous system. And that train track is going to run the sexual stimuli on the train. And if everything's clear and smooth, and that hits the brain, the brain's like, all right, all right, let's do it. I like this. And then things get going. But if you have brakes being laid down all day and it gets really complicated because the brakes can be personal, like the way you feel about your body, it can be what's going on with your hormones. It can be that like, you're afraid someone's going to walk in on you. Yeah. Um, these are normal breaks, but it also can be relationship stressors. Like your partner isn't tending to your needs. I try to explain as often as possible to men that for women, sex, foreplay, that whole business, that starts way early in the day, way outside way the bedroom. Early. Clearly. Yeah. And so if things they're doing and things that are happening in your life are laying down these brakes on the train track, then when you get that sexual stimuli, so your partner's like, Hey, I know she loves it when I nibble on her ear, they're nibbling on your ear and your brain's like, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. I can't like, it literally cannot go. And so this is important to understand because that's an area where we have to start to remove things 
And then we can focus on the brakes or excuse me, on the gas because we've removed the brakes. And that's where we can go in and say, okay, now she likes this certain scent. And now like, you know, these, but that's where like Hallmark tells us to focus, like get the damn card, get the flowers, get the chocolate. By the way, none of that actually works. Um, what works is that you've actually thought about your partner. You've thought enough to take action for your partner. You've brought them something and And you've done a gesture of like, I'm any of that stuff. It literally could be, hey, what do you need today for me to make your life easier? And you do that. And they, they're they like, oh, okay. Like you're, you're making my life easier. You're thinking about and you're tending to me. Like it can show up in a lot of different ways. It doesn't, and gifts don't work for everybody either. No, so do the laundry. That is, <laughs> yeah, do the laundry. Put the chonies in the in the hamper. We love that. Like that yeah. is yeah, sexy. Some dinner, do some, you know, it's true. Yeah. It's just, you got to do those little things every day. I agree. That's amazing. That's totally. an amazing point. So these things can exist for any gender. It's important for people to understand yeah. that they do because this model actually, they set out to study men and then they were like, wait a minute, we should look at women. And then they're like, oh yeah, like this is like women ha can have really sensitive breaks and, you know, they might have more breaks and, you know, I mean, imagine that we get marketed to society to, to, to be told that like, no matter what you do, you're never enough, like in every yeah. capacity. So oh, like there's a lot of breaks in itself. And so um, this, is important because it may not be that you actually have a low libido. It may very well be that you have to identify your breaks, which in the libido chapter, I give you a um, psychology intake form. It's truncated. That's commonly used. That's based on this research for you to understand what those breaks are and what gets you going. And I encourage people, if you are with a partner, both of you should take it and communicate right. around it. And then in the 28 day program, as I'm helping you heal your hormones and fix that hormone component, I also have an exercise for you to go through that again. Because the other thing about libido is that it shifts with our cycle. And mm -hmm. so your interest in sex, your ability to come aroused, and even your orgasms are at the height around ovulation. And then they come way down in the luteal phase. And that's also normal. But because nobody talks about it, we feel like something's wrong with us or worse, right. our partner is like, you're rejecting me, something's wrong with me. And then that creates conflict and strife. And that only puts more breaks. You know, we see, um, with our patients, the husbands will get involved when it comes to libido. Oh yeah. Always. Probably more than <laughs> anything. And they'll say they'll it's in their opinion, it's gotta be their hormones, which we know hormones mm -hmm. definitely play a role, but as you yeah. were just saying, a lot of it is not, it, it's, and we have to explain to them, it is not just that, you know, it yeah. is stress. It plays a big role. How the person feels about you plays a big role. You know, it's not just that she needs some, you know, whatever you want me to give her. And <laughs> then suddenly yeah. she's going to be like, throw yeah. her clothes Let's off. Jump into day. bed. Right. <laughs> totally. And then when, you know, but the thing that I like to post to them is when they're like, it's your hormones. Can you fix your hormones? I'm like, well, you could stop pushing her cortisol because cortisol, <laughs> yeah. like everyone thinks about testosterone and I yes. talk about testosterone in the book because it is absolutely important, but it's mm -hmm. never an isolated, like I need testosterone because I have a low libido. It's not that I have a whole low testosterone intake. And if your libido is truly due to low testosterone, then we will see other symptoms that come up with that. But cortisol is a big player. Cortisol can be really problematic because if your body is like, I'm under threat and I don't understand why, it's, it's, why are we going to try to get pregnant? And if you're like, but I'm not trying to get pregnant, shh, your body doesn't know that your body and your body is like, that's what it's whole agenda is with ovulation and with the hormones and like everything is towards getting pregnant. And so it's really important, I think, to understand the hormones holistically because estrogen can also be a problem of why um, we're not getting in the mood. Low estrogen. So estrogen is like very Goldilocks, got to be just right. And so we've got to get that estrogen dialed in. If cortisol is not right, progesterone won't be right. Now, estrogen is not going to be right. You got someone with hypo thyroidism or Hashimoto's forget it. Like they got to heal and, and orgasms are part of healing. It is really important, but like, they're not going to be inclined to 
mount the energetic response to engage in sex. So that means the partner is going to have to be the one that engages and also removes the brakes, removes the stressor. So it is very complex as I, and I break it all down in the book so people can definitely understand that better. But it is so often that I see men that are like, she just needs some testosterone. And I'm like, mm. I wish, <laughs> um, I wish. It is why if people are ever like, why isn't there the equivalent of female Viagra? Well, all Viagra does is make a penis hard. <laughs> yeah, okay. Exactly. Like that does nothing for making you want a penis. It doesn't do anything for that. So that the reason why there is no like, you know, comparison in women's health is because it doesn't work that way. And there's different reasons women have sex. There's different reasons women don't want to have sex and context and experience. matters. And if your past experience of in connection, I don't feel empathy for my partner. I feel like this is like, there's just expectations. Like you want to get somebody out of the mood, expect it from them. Act like every kiss must lead to sex. And that is actually one of the things I talk about in the book is like, when you kiss for kissing sake, if somebody is like a high pressure situation, like Valentine's day makes me never want you to touch me. Like, yeah. because I feel like I have to have sex. That is very, very common. But instead if you start training their nervous system, and this is literally what you're doing is training their nervous system with their consent, that, that kissing is for kissing sake, touching right. is for touching sake. It yep. gets them to relax. It gets them feeling more connected. And then when it's time to move things along because you're both consenting, it's a lot easier ride. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. What about food um, that, to help support libido? What foods can help with that? <laughs> You know, I'm actually um, lecturing in London in a couple of weeks and um, they just told me that I have to have black and white slides, which no one, I always, people who've been to my lectures know I have very colorful slides. I put vulvas on them. I put like all kinds of things on them. Um, but this is like the UK and, and I'm wondering, um, I haven't had a conversation with them, but I'm wondering, did my vulvas offend people possibly? Anyhow, I, why I'm bringing this up is because I was like, well, if my slides can't be loud, like I'm a Latina, like, what are you doing to me? Then my clothes are going to be loud. And I just I found that. an outfit that I'm like, I'm going to wear this, but I'll look like a watermelon. And I was like, actually it's perfect because watermelon rinds are rich in citrulline. And mm -hmm. this can really help with sexual desire and just sexual performance overall. So citrulline <laughs> is, that was my long winded, but if you are a fashionista and you like this kind of talk, then I, I'm glad that I had it. And if you're like, this is boring, um, wait till you see the photos. <laughs> so, um, but citrulline can be a great one. And you can make pickled watermelon um, rinds or mm -hmm. something else you can do. And I wash your rinds off well because they can definitely have mold. You should wash them before you cut your watermelon that we don't want mold. Okay. Yeah. Avoid the mold. Mm -hmm. um, but with watermelon rinds, the other thing that I'll do is I will just take like a small amount and whip it up at the bottom of a smoothie and then make the rest of my smoothie. So I'm getting some of that in. Um, so that's one I talk about in the book. I do talk about a whole like sex diet when I think I'm funny and I'm like, it's not fasting y'all. It's not like yeah. we're like abstaining from sex. It's a, you can definitely eat in a way to support your sexual health. So um, if you go to drbrighton.com slash ITN dash resources, so is this normal resources? I have a, I built a cookbook around this book that you get with it. And in there, I take you through all of the things that can help your hormones, but also what can help so that you've got increased blood flow to the clitoris when you want it, because the clitoris swells like the penis swells when you get aroused. And so we need circulation for that. We also need insulin to be down at optimal levels rather than being high, because we know that's associated with decreased clitoral sensitivity. So you need to be working on blood sugar balance. And then we need your microbiome healthy. And this is always when women are like, why are you talking about my gut? They might understand why I'm talking about their gut and their health, but they're like, why are you talking about my gut and my vagina? And it's because the estrobilome is managing your estrogen. Your estrogen is managing the lactobacilli inside the vagina and lactobacilli are keeping that BV and that yeast away and keeping all of the tissue healthy along with the estrogen. And when we have healthy estrogen, we are able to self-lubricate a lot easier. Although there are certain times of our cycle where you'll need lube. And I swear I talk about lube so many times in the book, um, but I've had a lot of people write me and say, thank you for saying it because I've been made to feel so many times that if I can't get wet, then something must be wrong with me. And I'm yeah. like, no, nothing wrong with you. It could just be your hormones or it could just be your nervous system's just not getting it together faster, mm -hmm. as fast as you want it to. 
Exactly. Well, I know everybody's going to want to go out and get your book. So can you maybe talk a little bit about the difference for listeners with Beyond the Pill and then is this normal so they know which one is for them and Mm -hmm. go into that a little bit? Yeah, that's such a great question because I've actually gotten that a lot and I was surprised because I was like, well, Beyond the Pill is all about birth control pill. Um, But yeah, and I'm like, no, it kind of makes sense because you're like, well, she's writing about hormones. How is it different? So then I will say, People who have read both Beyond the Pill and then got Is This Normal, they have told me that they felt Is This Normal was really so foundational to understanding their body that they then went back and read Beyond the Pill. Um, In Beyond the Pill, I talk a lot about birth control, coming off of birth control and staying on birth control and like how to, excuse me, how to protect your body. And I go a lot into the science of like how liver detox works and how gut health works. And Is This Normal? I was like, listen, I got a lot of like sex ground to cover because I got a lot of those questions and I wanted to make sure that we answered as much about hormones as possible that instead of, and what the feedback I got from people with Beyond the Pill was I didn't really need all of the science that was behind liver detoxification. So I put a liver, I put a liver diagram in there and was like, here's the nutrients for phase one. Here's the nutrients for phase two. And here's the chart Mm -hmm. of where you get all those nutrients in your food. So you can just jump in. And Mm -hmm. so anyone who's read Beyond the Pill, you know, my style is to write books so that you can just get in, get the information you need and walk away and still feel satisfied and never have to read it front to back. And And um, is this normal is the same way. There is a 28 day program in there. And in the 28 day program, we are not only focused on hormones and I take you week by week of your cycle, but we're also journaling and doing exercises around understanding your normal for your sexual health. Because for as long as you've been alive, everyone else's ideas of what is normal has been put on your body but only you can know what that normal is. And so I help you understand that if you're like, I don't want the sex stuff. Don't worry. It's there. If you, if you ever need it, should you ever need it? And so the, really the aim here is to help you. You're going to take a a quiz and understand which hormones you need to focus on. There's lifestyle, nutrition, and supplement protocols in there. And the whole idea is so that you can take ownership of your body, start to get your hormones optimized so that you feel the best in your body and have the exact information you need to have a more productive conversation with your doctor and know when to go to the doctor. And the reality, as we know healthcare work, how it works, it's going to take a while to get to the doctor. Mm-hmm. And so they, I made the protocol so that whatever you are doing is going to complement whatever comes next with your doctor. It is all the stuff that really it takes to heal and to feel better that happens outside the doctor's office. But for example, if you have high testosterone and then you go to the doctor and you get the PCOS diagnosis and they're like, well, you should use metformin. You can use spironolactone. You have the alternatives already. And at the same time, if you use metformin, spironolactone, birth control, any of that, you still need to tend to your diet and lifestyle. And you've already got a leg up on all of that. That's so great. Yeah. Your books are great. I mean, they're very easy to read and to pick things out of if that's your style or read fully through however you want, but you get a lot of really useful information. So thank you so much for coming on. You know, um, this has been amazing. And where else can people find you? Well, I'm all over social media at drjoleenbrighton.com or Jolene Brighton, excuse me. And then I'm also at drbrighton.com. And my last name is tricky. It's B-R-I-G-H-T-E-N, Brighton like the sun, not like Brighton UK. (laughs) Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes too, so you guys can just click on it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. And if you love this episode, please leave a review. It only takes a couple minutes. And you can find out more about us on drbeckycampbell.com. And you can follow us over at Instagram on at Health Babes Podcast, at Dr. Becky Campbell and at Dr. Crystal Hone. Have an amazing day.